Stayallday.com. You're now tuned into the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there, boldly and authentically in the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative that is go get an energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of wait for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, insights, strategies, and techniques underneath the umbrella of one unified philosophy that is called work on your game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is comparison questions. I'm going to talk about exactly what I mean by that in a moment. But before we get into that, I'll remind you all of a couple of things. First of all, Daily Motivation Text. Send this out every single day, every week as well. Guaranteed to have you focus sharp and on point to start your day or week. All you got to do to to receive that message is join my text community. It is free to do so. Just text me at the following number, 305-384-6894. Once you text me, you'll be in the community. When those messages are going out again, we have some tech issues we've been working on for some time now. But when we get those fixed, which I do anticipate to happen, which is why I still talk about the daily motivation text, you will be getting those messages as we get it reactivated. So if you're already in, you don't have to do anything. It'll Once they're working again, you'll be getting them. Secondly, work on your game, university. That is the place where I do all my coaching. That's the place where you can work with me directly. That's the only place to have me as your direct coach in your uh, for your business and in your life, period, because we don't limit our coaching to just talking about work. We coach you holistically because the things that are happening at home, whatever that is, that affects what happens in the business. And any of you who uh, runs a business, especially if you're uh, the principal in your business, you're the person in charge, you're the most important person there, uh, what's happening at home affects what's happening in business. And what happens in business affects what happens at home. So all of this stuff is uh, all in one big pot here. So work on your game university. We have a four-part framework based around mindset, strategy, systems, and accountability. It is the only place to have me as your direct coach. Go to work on your game university.com. That link is down below uh, in the description from wherever you are listening to this. So with that out the way, let's get into the topic here today, which is comparison questions. Now, what does this mean? Well, we all have heard of, or maybe some of you, maybe many of you have heard of the concept of modeling. When I say modeling, I don't mean walking down a runway or posing for a photo shoot. When I say modeling, what I mean is looking at someone else who has some outcome or circumstance that you want to have, and then looking at what they are doing, thinking, uh, their habits, and you modeling your behavior after their behavior with hopes of being able to mimic the success or outcome or circumstance that that person has. So when I say modeling, that's the type of modeling I'm talking about here. And modeling is a very uh, valuable success habit because if you can see someone else who has a certain level of success and you see what they're doing, you say, okay, this person has uh, this type of work ethic. This person has these specific habits. This person abstains from doing these things, but I'm always doing them. Or this person is doing these 10 things over here that I've never done. Maybe that's a reason why there's a big difference between their outcomes and my outcomes. So modeling is a good idea when you can find the right people to model. So what we're going to address here today are some questions that you can ask yourself whenever you are looking at another person that you could be considering modeling. And they, these questions will help you get clarity on what you should model from another person when you're looking at yourself and figuring out what can I borrow from this person? because when you're modeling someone, you got to not only, of course, there are things that you're going to uh, see them doing and you're going to adopt those things and use them, but you got to pick the right things because human beings have a lot of things to them. I mean, think about your own life. How many different things do you have going on in your life, in your mind? How many different uh, habits do you have? How many different behaviors do you uh, partake in? A whole lot of them. So if someone was modeling you, they probably don't have to model every single thing that you do, but they have to pick the right things to model. And today's episode is going to help you get clear on what those right things are for you to model. Okay, now let's get to it. Point number one. Topic, once again, is comparison questions. So when you are modeling, these are the questions that you should ask. And I'll probably, that will probably be the title of this episode, something that sounds like that. I'll think of something good. Point number one, action comparison. First thing you have to do is compare actions between the person you're modeling and yourself. So you would ask yourself something like, what is this person doing that I am not doing? That's a, actually a pretty simple one. What are they doing that I am not doing? 
And the flip side to this question when it comes to action comparison is what does this person not do that I am consistently doing? Those are some pretty good questions to ask yourself when you're trying to model yourself after another person. For example, when I was in college as a athlete, as an athlete, I played at the division three level, which is a level that doesn't really produce professional players. And as such, most of the players who I played with in college did not have ambitions for playing at the next level of basketball. They were pretty much going to play college ball. And when college was over, that was it pretty much for basketball. As far as aspiring and ascending in basketball. It doesn't mean they couldn't play in a local you know, rec league or some tournament in their hometown, but as far as ascending, that was as far as most of those players wanted to go. And as such for that, a lot of the players who I played with in college, you never saw them in the gym practicing on their own accord outside of whatever was required by the coaches and you know, by being a member of the team. So when you're on the team, we have basketball practice every day, you know, at four o'clock, whatever. So all the players showed up to that. But outside of that, I never saw many of my teammates who I played with in college. I played with a lot of different players. Many of them, I never saw them go to the gym and just practice on their own to try to just get better at their own skills individually. Now, why was this the case? This was the case because most of these players did not have ambition for moving forward. However, there were a few players who I played with in college. I would say I could count them on. I'm just thinking about who the players are. I could probably count them on one hand. Out of all the players I played with in college, I could count on one hand the players who I played with who would ever, on their own volition, go to the gym and actually work on their skills on their own. And I'm bringing this up to say this. The players who were serious about going to the next level, because all these players who I'm thinking of, they were all serious about at least having the desire to go to the next level. Many of the players I played with didn't even have the desire or they didn't even have the inkling in their mind that they could play professional basketball. And guess what? None of them did. But the players who had the desire, they had at least had the thought in their mind. Guess what was the, uh, the correlation between that thought and their behavior was that you would see them in the gym practicing by themselves. I was one of those players who would practice by myself outside of whatever was required by our coaches in the team. Uh, my teammate, Wes Pfeiffer, who you've heard on the show, if you've been listening to the show long enough, he's one of the few people I've actually interviewed on this feed. He was a player who would practice by himself. It's one of the ways that we first connected when he uh, came to my school, because I was already there when he got there. But he's a guy who would go to the gym and practice on his own. And we connected because of that, because he saw that I would do it. I saw that he would do it. I said, OK, here's somebody who's serious about basketball. They're not just playing because they're at school and they happen to be on the basketball team. And there were a couple other guys. And when I say a couple, I literally mean a couple. I told you I could count them on one hand. It's only five fingers. All right. Only a couple other guys who I would ever see in the gym practice by themselves in an attempt to just make themselves better just because they wanted to. Now, there are players who will come and practice if I said to them or uh, one of my other teammates who was serious about working out, let's say uh, Wes Pfeiffer or myself, would say to one of our other teammates, hey, we're going to go to the gym and work out. Just our us come to come do this workout with us. Yeah, any of our teammates, if we ask them or they'll try to uh, influence them to come to the gym and work out with us, they would do it. But would they do that if we weren't asking them to do it or we weren't telling them that that's what we were going to do? No, they wouldn't do it because, again, their actions correlated to where they saw themselves going and where they saw themselves going was after college. Nowhere when it came to basketball. Now, I'm sure all of them, most of the guys I played with in college, I'm sure they're very successful professionals at something in life. But it wasn't going to be basketball because they just didn't have the ambition. And often with someone's ambitions, you can tell through their actions. And that's why I'm bringing this all up. When someone's ambitious about something, you can tell through the things that they do that they're ambitious about it. I'll give you another example. I had a, a friend back home in Philadelphia, where I'm from, where, who I, once I was probably maybe, hmm, it's probably somewhere between the ages of 19 and 22, something around that, that age group. I was you know, continuing to get better at basketball. I was at that point playing college basketball, and I had aspirations of playing professional basketball wasn't quite sure how I was going to do it yet, but I had the aspiration of doing it. I remember one of my uh, friends who I grew up with since a kid, he was a basketball player, a pretty good player himself. And he maybe kind of, sort of, not sure, might have thought he could maybe play at the next level as well. He was going to play college ball. He did go on to play college ball. And maybe he had an idea of playing pro ball. And he saw my uh, development. He saw my advancement. He saw how I was moving up in the game of basketball. He could see my... Um, progression. And 
one day when we were at our neighborhood playground, he was just saying to me, like, yeah, let's, let's work out. What kind of workouts do you do? He was inquiring. And this is something that would happen to me often, probably from the age of about, from about age 18 on, I would get this a lot from people that when they would play with me or see me play or they would wander onto a court where I was playing, we would play some one-on-one -on -one or something like that. They would start asking questions about how often I practice, what I did, if we could work out together, et cetera, because they could see that I could play. And it was obvious that the reason I could play is because I practiced. It wasn't because I was just naturally, I didn't just roll out of bed and just do this stuff. I developed these abilities through intentional and conscious practice. So this friend of mine, a friend I've known since childhood, he asked me, he started asking me these questions. Like, what kind of workouts you do? We do some workouts. And we were already at the playground. So I said, all right, let's just do a workout right now. He said, okay. So we started to do a workout and I'm bringing this all up because I got to tell you something important about this friend. Now, this friend at one point, I don't know uh, where exactly he picked up this habit, but he picked up this habit of liking to smoke. He was a smoker and he, I don't think he smoked cigarettes too much, but he definitely smoked marijuana. And this is back before marijuana was like pretty much widely acceptable everywhere. This is where smoking marijuana could technically get you arrested if you had if you were smoking marijuana or you had it on you, you could technically be arrested for it. For the most cop part, cops would leave you alone. If they saw you smoking weed, they just expected you to respect their presence and just put it away or you know, hide it. Or if they saw you smoking, they would say, put that out. If you put it out, they pretty much leave you alone. I didn't know anyone who ever got arrested just for having weed on them. Now, I, knew, I do know people who got arrested for having weed in their vehicles. But for the most part, you wouldn't get arrested for it, but it was kind of like, all right, don't just be open about it. Now you can be open about it. But back then you had to kind of hide it. So this friend, he had picked up this weed smoking habit sometime in our teens. And clearly at this period, we weren't hanging out with each other that much. He was hanging with some other people who were, who were also friends of mine, but not as you know, not really close. Because, again, I wasn't doing a lot of the things that they were doing. And because he had picked up on this marijuana smoking habit, it had an effect on his cardiovascular uh, capacity. <laughs> in other words, he just didn't have the energy, he didn't have the lungs to do what I could do as far as the workouts. On top of the fact that he had not done the kind of workouts that I had been doing, so he didn't have the stamina or the energy. So it was compounding the issue. So we go through this workout, and again, this workout wasn't that long. It was about 20, 30 minutes. We were just doing stuff, and I was really, while we were on the court, I was making up drills for us to do, kind of stuff that I would do on my own, but I was just making stuff up for both of us to do. I had him doing it, and he's, so it would be something like, um, go touch this line and run and touch that line and make a layup and then sprint to the other end of the court and sprint back, do the same thing over and over again, do it 10 times in a row. So it was basically a, a skill versus skill combined with cardiovascular drill that I had him doing. And I was doing it as well, but I was in shape to do it. He was not in shape to do it. And I remember when we got to the end of the workout, he was like damn near dead. He was damn near coughing up his lungs because he wasn't in great shape. And he said after that, he was like, man, we could do this every day. I, I want to do more of this, this workout because I need to get in shape. So he could tell by the workout how not in shape he was. And I could tell as well. And he said, hey, we, could, we should do more of these because I want to get in shape. Now, how many more times do you think he and I did a workout like that? If you're guessing zero, then you're right because we never did it again. But the point being, this is one of the things that he was doing that I was not doing was partaking in the uh, smoking of the marijuana. And that did play a role in my energy and stamina versus his energy and stamina. Uh, again, this all is part of point number one, the action comparison. You're modeling yourself after another person. Look at what they are doing that you're not doing. Also look at what you are doing that they are not doing. Because sometimes you may be doing some stuff that you need to eliminate. Sometimes to move forward in life is not all about addition and doing more stuff. Sometimes it's about what you need to stop doing. What do you need to get rid of? And this one, when it comes to actions, this is the easiest to discern because it's easiest to look at and see other people's actions. Actions are usually pretty obvious and self-evident. You can just see what a person is doing. And when someone's a public figure or they're very visible in your world, again, you can just simply observe them and it's clear what they do and what they don't do. Look at the results of their actions, look at the inputs, and you can see what leads to what. Now, this may not always be an exact science because you may see someone doing a certain thing and then you incorrectly uh, ascribe habit A to outcome B. That's not always the case. For example, if you see someone posting on social media 10 times a day, and then you also hear that they make a million dollars a month, it might not be because they're posting on social media 10 times a day, they make a million dollars a month. So you're a cop, don't copy the habit blindly thinking that just because you copy this piece that you get that piece. So you may have to get a deeper or more clear picture of 
how certain actions lead to certain outcomes. Don't always think that uh, correlation and causation are, don't confuse correlation with causation. Just because you see someone doing thing A does not mean it's leading to thing B. And people often get that wrong and they often do it out of convenience. They just copy the things that seem fun and easy and uh, conveniently copyable for them. And then they leave out the stuff that seems a little bit harder and a little bit more difficult and that require a little bit more discipline. So again, confusing correlation and causation can cost, cost you a lot of your resources to no end. You still don't get the outcome that you expected. So while you may not be able to see every action a person takes, this is probably the easiest one to notice for and with most people. If you do something such as going to the gym consistently and someone in the gym is in much better shape than you, well, just follow them around, not follow them, but follow, take a look at what they're doing when you see them in the gym. You can see what they're doing. You also see what they're not doing. All right. And you can compare your behavior to their behavior and ask yourself a simple question. What are the differences between what they're doing and what you're doing? I guarantee you, you will notice some differences and there are probably a whole lot of differences. It's also important to pay attention to what actions you do that, again, people who have what you want, what they are not doing. Here's where you can make some big strides by, again, the simple process of elimination. Sometimes it's the things you need to stop doing that make the biggest difference. An author who did a great job of helping me understand this was Tim Ferriss, who he wrote his series of uh, four hour books, four hour work week, four hour chef, four hour body, and uh, many others that aren't titled four hours, but many uh, books about what he really talks about is just deconstructing how outcomes are created and just figuring out how we can all be more effective and efficient in achieving certain outcomes. That's, that's the, the gist of what Tim Ferriss writes about. And in the process, because many of these books are about de deconstructing these elements of success, and it's also about eliminating habitual behaviors that many of us do because we think those behaviors are leading to success, but they're ultimately inconsequential or maybe even destructive to our success, maybe even sending us backwards. For example, during my professional athlete days, I used to do these 90 minute weightlifting sessions in the gym. I'd go in the gym and I'd be doing all different types of lifts. And I liked doing it. I liked being in the gym. I liked the atmosphere of the gym and the people I would meet in the gym. And of course, the results of the effort. I had you know, all these muscles. I was, I was looking pretty good from doing all this lifting. But after reading Tim's book called The Four Hour Body, I realized that I could get similar results, but not after just reading it, but actually uh, practicing some of the things that he wrote about in the book. I realized that I could get similar results that I was getting from 90 minute workouts from doing 25 minute workouts. Same gym. I just reduced the things that I was doing to the essential few. And I was lifting instead of 90 minutes, 25 minutes, I, would, I had the same results. I'm still in pretty good shape to this day. If you've seen a photo of me, you can tell me what you think. And I was in that shape when I was playing ball, when I was doing 90 minute workouts. Now I can get in that same shape by only doing 25 minute workouts if it was through lifting. I do different stuff these days, but the whole point is I started following that process and it literally worked exactly the way that he said that it would. He theorized it, then he tested it, and then he put it in his book because he found that it actually worked. So what I did was buy myself 65 minutes per day of time because I went from 90 minutes to 25 and I still was getting the same result. So this is a result of progress by elimination, not by addition. So these are things you have to pay attention to. And it's important on this point here, again, I want to emphasize that just because you see someone doing something does not mean that's the reason they're getting a certain outcome. So you have to find the right ingredients to lead to an outcome. Correlation and causation are not the same. Just because someone is doing one thing does not mean that's the thing that's leading to the outcome. It may be something different that you're not noticing. Point number two, today's topic, once again, is the comparison questions you ask when you are modeling your behavior after another person's. Number two, the input comparison. What does this mean? When you are trying to model the outcomes or the success of another person, you got to ask yourself the question, what is this person reading, watching, consuming, and engaging with that I am not? What inputs is this person engaging in that I am not engaging in? And again, this is another one you can flip yourself. You can flip around and ask yourself, what are you engaging in or with that this more successful person is completely ignoring? Again, thinking back to my friend from point number one. He engaged with smoking a lot, smoking marijuana. He did a good amount of uh, alcohol consumption as well. And I wasn't doing much of any of that. And that was an input that he probably needed to eliminate if he wanted to get in better shape. But I don't know if he ever did or not. But 
that was the situation. I know what he was. I know what he was engaging with, and what I wasn't, and it played a big role in the outcomes that we both had during that uh, one infamous workout that I'm remembering. So this is another one you need to flip on yourself. This one is usually easy to discern, even if you can't see it with your own two eyes, because people who are successful usually tell you exactly where they're getting their information. People who are successful usually are pretty open about where they get their information, what they're consuming, how they get it, why it matters to them. Usually they talk about it. You know, if you just ask them, those are tough. And if they happen to be a public figure, they usually are pretty open about announcing, hey, I'm going to this event. I'm reading this book. I'm going to this conference. I got this information. I hang with this person. But even if they're not, you can just ask them again. It's usually not a secret how a person who has some level of success, what are the inputs that they're taking in? You just ask them, what kind of books do you read? Do you go to any courses? Do you go to events? Uh, anything like that? You just ask them, they'll tell you. Again, these are not, it's not top secret information, but you have to ask if you can't tell. So you can ask people, what books you read? What courses are you taking? What conferences do you go to? Who do you follow on social media? What channels or podcasts do you subscribe to? And again, a lot of it is public information for anyone to consume if you know about it. So while this may take the extra step of asking, this is also pretty easy to figure out because usually people will just tell you. All you have to do is ask a question, get the answer if you really want to know. And once you have those answers, now you have to compare those answers to the things that you are consistently consuming and ask yourself, where do you have waste products? In other words, what are you consuming, reading, watching that play no role in your future success? So you find someone who has success that you want to have and you ask them, well, OK, what do you consume? What do you read? What do you watch? And they tell you about some podcasts they listen to, their favorite audio books, the book they're currently reading and the courses and co courses they take and the conferences they attend. And they say, that's pretty much all I consume. And then you compare that to your consumption and you're consuming the, the, the mixtape of some rapper. Listen to it 10 times a day. You're watching three hours a day of Netflix and you're scrolling through uh, Instagram Explore feed looking at nonsense and uh, engaging in the comments and laughing at people arguing with each other. Okay, they didn't mention that. So process of elimination, what do you need to get rid of? Do you see how that works? So you need to compare what other people are consuming to what you're consuming when you're looking to model them. And then you may have to make some tough decisions. What are things that are playing no role in your future success? You may even, if you know this person well enough and they're willing to give you their time, say, hey, I'm doing this, this, and this. Do you do any of that? How much Netflix do you watch? Just ask them. How much Netflix do you watch? How much time do you spend scrolling on social media every day? Uh, how, much, how many times a day do you listen to some uh, rapper mixtape? And see their answers. Compare their answers to your answer and ask yourself, okay, uh, is there an opportunity here for me to eliminate something? So it will save you a couple hours a day right here if you just stop scrolling on social media. So any of you who is a social media scroller, let me give you back a couple hours of your day by telling you to stop doing that. That's one habit that I guarantee you is not really contributing to your success unless you happen to work as an engineer at a social media company and you are scrolling the app because you're doing it for market research purposes. Other than that, uh, you stop doing that. There's your time back. And now you can go do something productive like read that book that you, quote unquote, don't have time to read. Point number three. Today's topic, once again, is comparison questions when you are modeling your behavior after another person. Number three, relationship comparison. Who does this person, the person you're modeling, who does this person have relationships and connections with and have conversations with? And specifically, what type of people that you do not? That's another question that, again, if you just ask and or observe, this one is pretty simple to figure out. And there's another one. You got to flip this around the same way. There's another question that you have to flip on its side and ask the question about yourself. Who do I have relationships with that are not actually serving me? Who do I have relationships with? Who am I spending time with? Who am I talking to? Who am I giving my resources to that is giving nothing back to me that is worth the investment? And you got to know who to get rid of. Now, this one may be a little bit harder to figure out, but ultimately is not impossible if you simply pay attention and you have a high level of awareness. So look around at the people who you know. And ask yourself, who has the most, who are the most successful people? Of all the people you know, who are the most successful individuals? And then ask yourself, who do these people hang with? Who do they have relationships with? Then ask, how did they create those relationships? How did that happen? Then ask, what do they do to nurture these relationships? Now, again, these things are easily found out if you simply pay attention and you have a high level of awareness. And 
how do you find me? How is it so easy to find out, Dre? You're saying it like it's so simple. Here, well, again, here's remember what I said. The most successful people who you know. So I'm not asking the most successful people you can find on the internet because you don't know them. The most successful people who you know. Go to them, whoever they are, and ask them, who do you have relationships with that really keep you, you know, at a high as a high level individual? And you can start off by offering them just a compliment. Hey, you're one of the most successful people I know. I'm reaching out to you because I'm listening to this podcast of this dude named Dre, and he said, reach out to the most successful people you know and ask them these questions about their relationships and the power of relationship. So now you just gave them a compliment. Now you have their ear and attention. They will answer your questions, guaranteed. Now you ask them, hey, who are the most valuable relationships that you have? How did you build those relationships and what do you do to maintain them? I guarantee you they'll give you an earful of an answer. Now, why are they going to give you an earful of an answer? For a couple of reasons. Number one, because you just paid them a compliment. So they will reciprocate by giving you something that you want because you gave them what every human being likes to be complimented. And if it's a genuine compliment, you're actually telling the truth that they're one of the most successful people that you know, they will appreciate it. So number one, they'll give you an earful because of that. Number two, because you're asking a question that most people need to ask, but do not ask. So finally, that successful person who you approach is going to be like, damn, finally, someone came around and actually asked me a question that they should be asking, which is, how can I get on a level of success by actually connecting with the right type of people? So they will be happy to point you in the right direction, if nothing else, simply because you're asking for something that most people need to ask for, but never do. And number three, because if you happen to be on this, you happen to be you know, climbing the steps of becoming a successful high level individual, that person will want you to be one of their contacts. Because when you become successful, maybe you might be one of their relationships that they want to have. And they may be one of the relationships that you need to have as you move forward. So if they, if they notice that you look like somebody who might be on your way to actually doing something substantial, they'll be happy to talk to you because look, they want more successful people in their circle. Why not? So if you will, like you might be becoming one, they'll be happy to talk to you. So you see, see how this works? So what you need to do is think of who are the five most successful people you know of or know, like know in a way that you could reach them and you can engage with them. You can send them an email, text message, phone call, see them in person. Five most successful people you know and use the exact framing that I just gave you. I was listening to this show, this masterclass by this guy named Dre Baldwin, and he said, reach out to the five most successful people you know and ask them three questions. You're one of those five people. Can I ask you three questions? Guaranteed they're going to answer you. And this is asking three questions. Who are your most valuable relationships? How did you build those relationships? And what do you do to maintain those relationships? One, two, three. All right, you can start, it, start using that. Any of you use it, please reach out to me. Let me know how it went. So if you're dealing with people who are in the public eye, and people in the public eye tend to share what they're doing. People are on social media. So you can see, you can go to some of my social media account, look who they're following. And it tells you a little bit about who they connect with. Those are the people they're following, especially people who don't follow a ton of people. So some people on social media only they may have uh, thousands or millions of followers, but they only follow like a couple hundred people. Look at the people that they're following. It'll tell you a whole lot about who they're connected with. So it's beneficial uh, to share through social media what you're doing. I mean, that's the whole point of social media. If you're not going to share what you're doing, what do you want social media for? So this is often easily found public information, who people are connected to. And again, you need to flip this question around. And ask yourself, who are you spending time with? And if the people you're spending time with are not helping you move forward towards success, why are you spending time with them? Remember that there is no neutral in the universe, ladies and gentlemen. You are either getting better or you're getting worse. There are no neutral people. There is no neutral time. There are no neutral behaviors. You're either getting better or you're getting worse every single day. So your relationships are either helping you move forward or they are holding you back. There is no relationship that just keeps you in the same spot. So you need to be evaluating your relationships. Point number four, today's topic, once again, is comparison questions when you're looking to model. Number four is a mindset comparison. How does this other person, the person I'm modeling, how do they think and make decisions that are ways that may be different from the way that I think and make decisions? Now, this one of everything that we've shared here comparatively is the most difficult to figure out, but at the same time is not difficult on the surface it's more difficult than the other three simply because you can't see a person's mindset that's the only reason why i call it the most difficult it is technically relatively the most difficult but in terms of just overall in a vacuum is not difficult to figure out a person's mindset and i'll tell you why in a second easiest way to discern what's going on in another person's mind 
And this, this could paradoxically actually make this the easiest one to figure out. But since we can't read minds, here's the easiest way to do it is to listen to somebody talk or read what they write. To consume a person's communication, they're telling you exactly what their mindset has going on. Because someone's words and behaviors are a reflection of their mentality. So this actually might be the easiest one to figure out because all you have to do is observe a person or just listen to them or watch them and you get a pretty good feel how they think. You want to get a good feel how I think. You may never meet me in person. You may have never met me in person or even seen me before, but you get a pretty good feel. You can get a pretty good feel of the way that I think by just listening to a month's worth of this show because um, I'm telling you every day. I'm talking to you for 20, 30 minutes every day. I can't say something that hasn't happened in my mind already. It's not going to come out of my mouth. I haven't already thought it. That's like scientifically impossible. So you want to know how somebody thinks, just read their writing. If they write, if they speak, listen to what they say. They're telling you exactly what's on their minds. Follow them on social media. Just look at the stuff that they're posting. It gives you a pretty good feel of who they are and what they're about. Just listen to them. You can, so any person who is publicly uh, available on social media and they're actively using any platform, all you got to do is follow them and pretty much stalk that person for about a month, you can get a pretty good feel of what they're about. Just look at everything that they post. They're op they an open book telling you exactly what their mindset is. So again, I called it the hardest one to figure out, but it's actually pretty easy to figure out. All you got to do is pay attention. See, the biggest challenge here, folks, of everything I've told you here today is your ability to be aware and pay attention. So none of us can read another person's mind. You never know exactly what another person is thinking, but if you listen to people talk, you get a pretty good idea. Our words are a reflection of our thoughts. So if someone has more success than you in a specific area, go listen to the content that they put out, if they have any. Read the stuff that they write, if they do any writing. Listen to the interviews that they've done, if they've been interviewed. And if this person is a public level person, like you take somebody who's like my level or higher, we, do, we get interviewed, we have our own platforms, we have our own content, we write books, we write articles, we have email lists, we put material out there on purpose because we were looking to get people's attention. It's pretty easy to figure out how people like me and others on of my ilk. It's pretty easy how to tell. It's pretty easy to tell how we think because we're putting stuff out every day, telling you exactly what's on our minds. Read through my emails. I'll tell you exactly what's on my mind, and I'll tell you exactly why every time. It it is no, it's no mystery what my mindset is because I'm giving it to you every day. Again, you can't read my mind, but you can read my articles. <laughs> you can't read my mind, but you can listen to the show. So this will give you insight on another person's thought process because their brains, because our brains, all of us, and our mouths are pretty close to each other. So look at where your, your brain is, is up at the, in your head, right? Behind your forehead, in between your ears, and your mouth is pretty close, right? So if you put your hand right where your brain is on your forehead and then put your hand and your thumb rather where your mouth is, you see you only have to stretch your hand all the way to reach both of them. They're pretty close to each other, which means everything that you think the first place it goes is to your mouth. It doesn't mean you say everything that you think, but the easiest way to get your thoughts out there is to speak them. There's a reason for that. So as you listen to people talk, ask yourself, what mindset do they appear to have that you don't have? And then when you listen to yourself talk and you listen to your own thoughts, ask yourself, what ways am I thinking that this person who I'm modeling doesn't look like they think about this, doesn't look like they think this way? Again, flip these around and ask yourself these same questions and from the flip side that you're asking about other people. And they'll tell you a whole lot about what you need to add and also what you need to subtract. Let's recap today's class, which is comparison questions when you are modeling. Number one, ask your comparison. What, are, what is a successful person doing that you're not doing? And what are you doing that they do not do? That important question. Number two is the input comparison. What is this person reading, watching, consuming, and engaging with? That I am not. And flip side, what are you reading, watching, consuming, and engaging with that they are not? Where are you wasting your resources on things that are not getting you to where this person is? And number three, relationship comparison. Who does this person have relationships with that I don't? Or what type of person? Not just the individual, but what type of person? And do, who do I have relationships with? And are these the type of people that I need to be connected with given where I'm looking to go? And number four, mindset comparison. How does this person think and make decisions in ways that are different from the way that I think? make decisions. And again, you find this out by just listening to people talk. They usually tell you exactly how their mind works because they are always, uh, always, 
what's the word, publishing their thought processes and their decision-making processes. That tells you a whole lot about a way a person thinks. Again, you can't read a person's mind, but you can read their words. Text me so you're in my text community. My number is down below in the description. Also, work on your game university. All right, you want to make sure you're modeling yourself after uh, success, after achievement, after goal getting. Go to workonyourgameuniversity.com. That is a place where you can have me as your direct coach. That's the only way for that to happen. And my superpower, folks, is breaking things down into simple, clear points, making sure you know exactly what you need to do, how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, why to do it, and make sure that it actually gets done so that you achieve the outcomes that you want to achieve. If you want to have me as your direct coach, that will happen, I guarantee. Go to workonyourgameuniversity.com. Work on your game. Dre, all.